computer recording. Mm -hmm. Yay, I love that. <laughs> Hi, everybody. We have Joseph Ricker here from the Titan Foundation. I'll uh, introduce you. <laughs> the what? Say that again. <laughs> Titan Foundation. SS Titan Foundation, which I have behind me. There's the beautiful drawing by Tony Strublick. Um, I'm Jill Carlier, and I run the Titanic Book Club here with Richard, who's also here. And we also have Bradley from the club, and we oh, have God. Lee from the UK. They're both from the UK. So right. the, the way we're doing it, everyone, is we've got everyone muted. If you would like to ask Joseph a question, go into the chat here and type, I have a question, and we will call on you and we'll unmute you, and then you can be on the floor. So I'm just going to go off of Joseph's, um, the SS Titan Foundation website here. Um, the SS Titan Foundation is the home of the proposed world's largest ocean liner, Titan, founded in 2008. Uh, Joseph's organization is looking to pay tribute to the great floating palaces of the early 20th century, most notably the infamous RMS Titanic. With her design and interiors, Titan will set a new standard in ship travel while honoring all involved with the Titanic legacy and forever remember, remembering those lost. The mission is to bring Titan to the world as the ship, age, the ship of ages, a vessel of light and hope for many of the world's sick and needy children, and to make a lasting and positive impact on their lives. So there's a, there's a big goal here. And um, I'm going to move you on to Joseph. Again, if you have a question and you're watching on Facebook Live, please type your question. I'll keep an eye out. And if you have a question here, in um, write in the chat that you have a question. And you are on the floor now, Joseph. OK. Uh, do you want me to just kind of go into what I'm doing or? Yeah. Just... Sure. To tell, us, um, tell us what got you started. What was the big idea? Or tell us what got you in. To Titanic that led to you having this great idea. Let us know about you. Well, um, pretty much like everybody else out there, uh, yourself and many of us in the Titanic uh, community that are Titanic enthusiasts, uh, was something I came across uh, at a very young age. Um, I know some people got into it when the movie came out in 1997, and some even after that, they weren't even born at that time. So there's always been a new generation of people who become interested in the subject. Um, I was fortunate enough to learn about it at the age of five. Um, I had just moved from Roseville, Minnesota to Blaine, Minnesota, and my mother had taken me to the local mall, which was a North Town, the North Town shopping mall in Blaine, Minnesota. And we went into one of the entrances. And as you went in there, there was, you know, the two walls there. And on the one wall, there was this gigantic ship. And I'm five years old. I didn't never seen like that in my life. So, um, but it had been built into the wall. It was about 60 feet long, the display. And it showed the Titanic racing through the North Atlantic in a night scene uh, with stars and had been painted in the background. And there was some uh, uh, big framed pictures on either side of the ship. So they kind of showed some images from the movie of the Titanic sinking and everything. I had no idea what this was. I mean, the smokestack on the ship was about as tall as I was. <laughs> so, and it was all lit up. I mean, it was a beautifully done model. And um, I'd ask my mother, you know, what is this? And that's a ship that sank a long time ago. And I immediately wanted to be, you know, more knowledgeable on that. I was five years old, but I still remember going to the Kmart across the street and actually found a copy a paperback copy of Walter Lords and I remember I still remember finding that on the spiral book uh, bookshelf they had there and I bought it you know? and uh, at the age of six I read that book you know fortunate enough I was lucky enough to read you know and so um, that's kind of where my interest in Titanic started and it's just been one progressive timeline from there um, one of my best friends I met in junior high school we found out we were Titanic nerds and 
it was right around that time that the movie raised the Titanic had come out. And so we had seen that in the theater a few times. And it was like, that became our dream at that time uh, as young teenagers to, we wanted to be the first ones to find the Titanic to actually put together some sort of a mission and, and get the funding and go out there. So I've been in dreaming of these weird things, you know, since a young age. Um, and then it was four years later when Robert Ballard found the Titanic. And uh, that was uh, quite interesting because when we did our studies on how the Titanic sank and where it sank and, and we did all these studies and just drawing up things and where it could be, because nobody knew where the Titanic was up until 85. So um, we had surmised that when they did find the Titanic, it would be sitting upright. And I remember my best friend, Ron, this, his name is Ron, and uh, his father was a Navy man. And he had listened to us a few times and walking by the bedroom, you know, and heard us talking as a couple of, you know, goofy kids. And I remember one time he came in there and says, you know, there's no way when that ship is going to be found that it'll be sitting upright. It'll be on its side or upside down. Mm. And we were like, no, no, it's going to be sitting upright. And he's like, yeah, okay, well, we'll find out one day, maybe, you know, and it was only about three years later when they found it. This was in the summer of 82 when we came up with these calculations. And um, he, he ate his words on that one. Um, when the Titanic was found, he's like, I don't know how you guys knew that, you know, that it would be sitting upright. Because in most cases, they're not. So um, anyways, after 85, um, you know, we kept our interest in Titanic, but, you know, it kind of faded out of the public uh, memory a little bit uh, after some of the initial specials. But then when James Cameron came out with that project in 96, and I had heard about it a year prior that they were doing something pretty massive, um, that's when I started to really perk up. And uh, I was really interested in seeing what was going to come out. And I heard from so many sources that this movie was going to be the biggest bomb in history. It's, you know, don't even go see it. <laughs> Whereas I was like, I want to see this. Um, and as we all know, history, uh, you know, was made with that, with that film and it did so well and it was the most successful movie in history. I was really shocked at the number of people around the world that really got into that subject. Now, granted, a lot of the youngsters went because of the Jack and Rose love story, but really the majority of the people that I've talked to and have read about, um, it was the, the ship itself and the history of what happened to it that night. And, um, and so that really triggered something. And then it was when my sister and I went to see the movie, after the movie was over, we were walking in the theater. I remember this very specifically. And she knows I'm kind of one of those flamboyant types, a dreamer, if you will, who might think of some wild ideas on a business or an idea or a concept. And she looked at me, she goes, why don't you just build a new one? <laughs> and I remember thinking, and I actually told her, my response was, do you know how much that would cost? And I shot her down and I didn't even think more of it. Um, it was a week later, I went to another showing of the movie. I saw it four times in the theater. So the fourth and final time in the theater that I saw Titanic, I was by myself. You know, other times I had friends and family with and everything. It was kind of a big deal. I wanted to share with them, um, you know, one of the biggest, you know, interests in my life and took them to the movie. Um, but that last time was by myself. And I saw the ship leaving Ireland and the engines were going and then they're going to pick up speed and go across the uh, Atlantic. And I just remember this light bulb went off in my head. It's like, wouldn't that be something if that was, you know, real again, you know, if we could see that in real life. And at that point, it was one of those aha moments, the light bulb went off in my head. And then I instantly was transported the week before when my sister had said, why don't they just build a new one? And all these images and ideas came out. It was like a light, bulb, like I said, a light bulb. I'm like, what would it take to do that? Really, what would it take to build something like that again? And my mind didn't even really, I don't think I remember watching the rest of the movie. I was just thinking of all these ideas, you know, how much would it cost? You know, who would build it? Um, you know, should we build, you know, the same as the original, you know, what would it take to do that? And so it was at that point that the idea was born really. It was, was, uh, at that light bulb moment is what, where I really started for myself. Um, and from that point on, uh, I went to my buddy Ron's house that night and, we discussed the subject and he was totally blown away, but he's like, well, let's see what we can do. We put some ideas together and uh, it pretty much progressed from there uh, within, um, I think it was April of 98 is when we had been very close to incorporating our, our idea. 
and it was right around that time there was an uh, an idea that it was floated in the the press that came out I think April 7th or something and we knew that the anniversary of Titanic was you know April 14th 15th and this was in the public eye it was something on CNN that this company in South Africa is going to build a new Titanic and we were like what we're about to incorporate our, our idea here in Minnesota and uh, so we were like totally shocked like oh now we have some competition here um, so we hurriedly got everything together. We filed their paperwork as a for-profit corporation in the state of Minnesota on April 13th, 1998. So two days before the anniversary. And, uh, I remember there was a local radio station. There's the biggest one in the twin cities, uh, WCCO 830 AM. And they had, did a, a small segment on this idea. Uh, I believe it was on the Mike Max program, uh, rush hour program. And he was talking about this new idea that, you know, because Titanic was the most popular movie in history at that point, in uh, April of 98, it was still in the theaters. And I was pretty much upset <laughs> because of, hey, this is kind of our idea, you know. And so I called the radio station. They actually had me on for about uh, five minutes talking about our idea. And I had actually several friends that started calling me after that. It's like, were you on the radio this afternoon? <laughs> It was pretty interesting, and I had a lot of good feedback on it. Like, wow, I didn't know you were doing this. It's like we were so close to we're incorporating here. So that gave us some publicity there. And uh, I believe it was – I can't remember. It was 98 or 99. It wasn't far after that. That's when they, uh, the Titanic uh, exhibit came to St. Paul, my hometown, and that's where they blew off the Titanic whistle for the first time in – you know, since the, the, you know, probably the day it sank. And so um, that was interesting that, that those whistles are blown in my town. I, I just couldn't believe it. It's like, even when you think as a kid and we, my, my best friend walking around St. Paul and we're talking about Titanic, we had no idea that 20 years down the road that the Titanic's whistles would be fired off in, in St. Paul, Minnesota. So it was like all these things were pointing to this thing, um, you know, maybe it's some sort of karma or something coming together that, you know, I had to be involved with this in some way, shape or form. So uh, we formed a website at that point and that was active for two years. Uh, then my youngest son was born, Derek, um, in 1999. And I just didn't have the financial wherewithal with all the continue with it. We were a for profit. We had no way to really reach investors at that time. And most people wanted money, you know, a, a significant investment on my part to, you know, do that. And it, it was it just kind of crumbled at that point for us. And uh, my friend Ron wanted to step away a little bit and I had stepped away because, you know, to raise my son. And then it wasn't very long after 9-11 happened. And we all know how that affected everybody. And of course, we all know that um, uh, they were doing the expedition at the time, which I didn't know for a while afterwards that they were actually on the Titanic when 9-11 happened. Uh, how ironic is that? They have the, the two greatest tragedies in the, of the, which I look at as the greatest tragedies other than the world wars uh, to have and you know, and you're on the one tragedy, the greatest tragedy of the 20th and 20th century. And now the, this new tragedy happens for the 21st century and they're actually there. So what a connection is, you know? Um, but anyway, uh, in 2007, my 40th birthday, I woke up, uh, decided, uh, you know, I had, kind of an epiphany that morning. I'm 40 years old today. It's like, what do I really want to do with the rest of my life? I'm, you know, 40, I'm decent health. I like to stick around as long as I can. So what do I really want to do with my life? And that idea came back in my head. It's like, I want to build this ship. I want to do that to help these kids and save their lives with the proceeds from such an operation. And so I started to put everything back together again and um, found somebody to put up a basic website. Um, and then in April of uh, 2009, uh, actually prior to that, in February of 2009, I had sent a proposal out to, through the Titanic Historical Society to reach Ken Marshall. And the reason for that was I wanted him to become involved in our project in some way, shape or form. Uh, but I really wanted his expertise and to do for real on an actual ship being built, what he did for James Cameron Titanic, which was as a visual historian, he knew the interiors and the exteriors of Titanic like no other obviously still does. And I wanted his expertise to be involved in the project, um, not only for his uh, expertise, but 
the fact that I look up to this guy. He's uh, been a, an idol of mine, and through his imagery over the years, especially Titanic uh, and Illustrated History, that book really opened my eyes to the beauty of this ship and how he did that as they look like actual photographs, as we all know. Just inspired me as an inspired James Cameron. And so I sent this proposal to him. I didn't hear anything back in February of nine, uh, 2009. And then it was in probably the last week of March, I found out that there, uh, THS was having their 45th anniversary on the Queen Mary in California, uh, where I had last been in 2000. And I then saw that he was going to be the keynote speaker at their, uh, at their grand uh, dinner. And I'm like, I have to go to this. I have to go there and meet him. And since I hadn't heard back from the proposal, um, I figured just to meet him in person to kind of see what the status of that was. And if he had maybe received it or got lost in the mail, I had no idea. Um, and so I went out there and met him. And that's kind of where everything started with my um, knowing a lot of people from the THS, uh, the Titanic Historical Society, and a lot of the people who were in the movie, such as Judy Preston-Inzi and Ellen O'Brien and others, um, obviously meeting uh, Ken Marshall and Don Lynch aboard. Uh, several photos were taken, as you could see from that Jill has posted, uh, you posted on the site here. And that was really the one of the best weekends of my life. I wanted to go out there to share my story and meet as many people as I could, but also obviously number one, take in what they were doing and remembering Titanic because that was the uh, as close as they can get to the Memorial weekend of April 14th and 15th. So this was, I believe, April 2nd through 6th is when the actual uh, event was held out there. So just a few weeks prior. Uh, and that's always been a, an important part of my life, learning about the ship, obviously, from a technical standpoint, but also learning about the stories of the people involved. People died on this ship, tragically, uh, horribly in some cases. You know, um, being stranded in the middle of the ocean with no lifeboats to save you. I mean, <laughs> we all know the story. And so that really reached into my heart. It's like, I would love to do this for these people. Um, and what better way to remember them but then by doing a project like this, which is very sensitive, especially to the families, because this is something that's gonna make a lot of money. And we all know the stories of Clive Palmer and his idea and others that have made money off the Titanic, I think, or trying to make money. And that has never been my view. My view has been to take that fund, that funding, that profit potential, that revenue, and pushing it somewhere where it'll actually save people. It'll create something positive from something so negative that happened. Um, and that was one of the things when me and Ken were talking that night, the first night I met him, um, he had actually stated to me that that was, um, he, he asked me, is this really what you want to do? You want to, if I understand you correctly, you want to take something that was so tragic and save lives of these children. I said, yes, sir. He goes, that's the only reason I'm talking to you. <laughs> so uh, that was a huge moment for me when he said that it was just such an uplifting thing to hear him say that. And how I feel about, you know, young children being affected by these uh, horrible diseases and afflictions. And so uh, to have him basically be on board with me in that regard was, was such a, you know, big victory for me in my life to continue moving forward with this project. And I know it's been 13 years since uh, 2008, since we've been incorporated as a nonprofit in Minnesota, even though I live in Texas now. Um, but I know I've run on with this speech, but that's kind of the whole story as it brings us up to today. Um, it's just something I've continued with. I don't want to give up on, and I feel that's something that needs to be done. And that brings us to this point. I love it. I didn't feel like you ran on at all. I loved hearing how you became interested in Titanic, which um, it really seems to be a theme for people that were uh, interested in Titanic before Cameron's movie came out was around six or seven. Um, so I think that is really neat. Do you want me to show some of the pictures of you? Hey, yes. I, I can't okay. see. I'm trying to look and focus on the camera, but uh, I know if you guys notice his, uh, his screen is behind him. All right, let me do the share screen. Cause I got these. Oops, what is that? That's not what I want. Oh, we got some people here now. <laughs> Look. We do. We have Alan, Bradley. Hello, Alan. Lee, you, Joe. All right, let's see. Sorry, I'm getting a phone blinking here. Here's one. Uh, you can, uh, you know, I'll click on them and then you can talk about them. How about that? <laughs> sure. 
Can you see that one? I have a picture right there, actually. Can you see that one? You in front of the Queen Mary? Yes. Uh, that, uh, that was a nice picture. That's when I first arrived at the Queen Mary for the first time in nine years. Um, right when I arrived that morning, I just got off the airplane and drove there and had somebody take that picture for me. And that I like that one. <laughs> oh, I should have started with that other one. Wait, your very first picture. Let me go. Sorry. Just pretend you don't see these, everyone. Maybe I need to go. Oh, there's. Wait, because I think I thought I had the one that your very first time on the Queen Mary. Was that this well, one? That wasn't. Yeah, I saw that earlier when you were you were kind of setting things up here. All right, where did it go? <laughs> we'll get back to these, everyone. Huh? Where did I'm it go? I'm to get a background story on those. Maybe it's in here. Maybe I just didn't open it up big. I'm gonna scroll down here. It's in there somewhere. I, I could have sworn we had it. <laughs> I think it's when you. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll come. We'll come back to these because I was opening them up big so people could see them. I must have just. Uh, it wasn't. The, oh yeah, look at all these I missed. Oh, here it is. <laughs> there I was it is. <laughs> so there's your. How old were you there? Oh, you don't have to tell us your age. But oh, uh, <laughs> I, was, I was 32, and my son had just been born the week before. That was January 8th, so my son was born. Um, on uh, well, ten days before it was December twenty eighth, so I had um, stayed home, and then I had to run and do some business in California. And I had four hours in Los Angeles before I flew back to Minnesota, and I—that's the only place I went. I went, did a quick drive through Hollywood, but that was it. So, people that don't know that might be watching, why yeah. the Queen Mary? Why is a lot of Titanic enthusiasts interested in the Queen Mary? I, I have my opinion, but well, I'd love to hear yours. <laughs> My, my explanation? Yeah. I think it's because it's the closest thing that we have on this planet that looks like Titanic. I mean, obviously, it was a lot bigger than Titanic. I think Queen Mary is uh, over 1,000 feet long, 1,030, something like that. Um, but, yeah, it was a lot. It's the only thing that really looks anything like Titanic now. It's all original woodwork. Titanic had all the woodwork. Some of the grand rooms, some um, Titanic probably didn't have those big rooms, obviously. But, um Really, it's it's like stepping back in time, and it was only built 20 years after Titanic uh, was in existence. They started the construction, I believe, in 1933, if I'm not mistaken, maybe maybe a little earlier. Uh, but I know it was first voyages in May of 36. So uh, they had it. Uh, I think there was almost a two-year shutdown. So it might have been 1931 when they actually laid the keel, but it was shut down for a period of time because of the depression. Um, they didn't have any money, no work. So yeah, it's uh, but it is the closest thing. It's you know it's got the three stacks, obviously not four, but um, just a gorgeous ship. And whoever hasn't been out there, uh, once things pick up and we get over COVID and we get our lives back normal, we hope soon. I really encourage people, you know, really especially in the United States, it's not very expensive to get out there on a plane and rent a hotel and just take an Uber. You know, find a place in Long Beach you can zip on over there. Yeah. Such a uh, a joy and a treasure to have that right here in our country, you know, instead of either being have broken up and used in World War II for bullets or whatever they would have melted it down into or laying on the bottom of the ocean. I mean, we're so fortunate to have this time capsule and the, the way ocean travel was and the way the liners used to look back then and with all the woodwork and all the engineering that they had to put in these things. It's amazing, especially the engine room with these big giant condensers and uh, wow, it's just an incredible ship. I love oh, it. Yeah, I agree. It just just looking at the size and. Mm -hmm. um, have you been out there, Jill? Have you been to the Queen Mary? Yeah, I went there for the anniversary event in 2016. I was actually out there for a retreat for something else, but I managed to break away and slip off, and I had to be back at the retreat at like 7 a.m., so uh, my friend uh, Rob had a two-bedroom room there, and he said, you want to crash? And I said, oh, really? And uh, it was just fantastic. It was the anniversary wow. event. Was it the 80th anniversary? It was really neat. It was, um, they oh, had a lot. Yeah, they have been 80 years old then, yeah. Yeah, yep. we had a lot going on, and then they, uh, Rob and I had a blast. Uh, if you pull out the drawers in the bedrooms and flip them over, people had been putting messages just over the years, and that was really fun to to see that. And we I ate in Hitchcock's. <laughs> Say that again. I vandalized the Queen Mary. Yeah. <laughs> you know, 
but I don't know. You, you wouldn't even small. know, you know, unless you. Um, a lot of people don't know that fact. Yeah, people don't know. I don't know. And then I had to wake up super early and zip out of there. But I was grateful just to be there at all. And, and then actually, I was able to go back. No, I guess that was the only time. So I would like to go. I guess it's closed now, right? It's closed. Yes, uh, I was out there twice in September and October. And uh, you know, it's been closed. Um, you can't even get on the ship. I don't even know if there's anybody on the ship other than an essential worker or two. So you have but, to go, in, yeah. go into YouTube and they will not allow you to park in the parking lot. Actually, the parking lot right in front of the Queen Mary is a COVID testing site. Oh, really? Wow. I didn't know that. And the closest you can park is probably two blocks away if you're lucky, because there's always people down there that are fishing right next oh. to the, the ship and everything. So it's it's kind of hit and miss if you want to park there. So yeah. And I know, um, I know if you live in California in that general area, you can buy this pass where you can just kind of mm -hmm. go whenever you want to. Which really There's plenty fun. of parking on the opposite side of the Queen Mary. Then you can probably just Uber over or, you know, if you want to take a long walk, <laughs> so you can just go over oh, the bridge. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it'll hopefully be open soon. I would hopefully, I'm, I'm hoping by the end of this year. And then we've got this picture. So I don't, it's probably not in order. This must have been another. Is this when you went and met with everyone? Yeah, that was taken last year in 2019 when my son and I went out there and we had the, a, a little Titanic get together with um, some really oh. wonderful people. Ellen, you were there. Yeah, I'll come back to that one. I've got the pictures of you. Sorry, I should have put these in order. Yeah. Uh, but we have Ellen actually here with us and I should unmute Ellen. Yeah, that picture was uh, in the Queen Salon back in 2009 during the Titanic Historical uh, Society convention. Oh, wait. Like, oh, they had a convention right on the Queen Mary? On the ship, yes. Yep. Wow. Did you meet George um, Behe there? I thought he said he was at that. I don't know if he was there. I don't remember meeting him, no. Okay. Uh, I did meet Ed Commuter and, and his wife, Karen. You know, I don't know if people know they were in the Cameron's movie, if you're ever looking. Just, uh, I just let, Alan, I just unmuted or if, if you want to say anything about that. Well, oh, not quite yet, but uh, if I do have something to add. Okay. Um... <laughs> I just want to let you know, since you're being a topic of discussion here, here's our Ellen and Judy. So whoever was with us last month, Judy was our author of the month last year. What'd you say? Sorry, Joseph. I love that picture. I love that too. It is good. I like it too. Yeah. That's really so you all had dinner together and and then well this was the first time we met, right? Yes, that was the first weekend. Uh I think those pictures were taken right before the uh the the big dinner they had, the uh gala dinner. Mm -hmm. And uh so there was some everybody was dressed up that night for the gala dinner. Uh Ken mm -hmm. Marshall was the uh keynote speaker of that. And he went on for about three hours, and I was riveted the whole time. So, um, uh, I've just heard Ken speak. He's really. Um, oh, so you guys were there for the. But I thought there was a. So this was this was for the convention. It just happened to be the. You guys doing a little photo shoot. Right, Judy and I did a, a talk on on uh, about the set being on the set, um, and the costumes and things like that. Okay, that makes sense. What year was this? That was April 2000. A long time ago. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you for remembering. Okay, well. A long time ago. That's where you all met then. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Let's see if I have any more. I love that background there. Let's see. If, so this must be something different than Joseph. That was just taken at a, at a function here in Dallas uh, back in 2013. Okay, and then I just thought I put it up as a publicity picture. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> <Not> Titanic related. <laughs> and where was this? Uh, that one there was in Orlando, Florida, in 2010. I know it's been a little while, but hopefully I haven't aged too much. Um, I really like how they set up that that thing. It looks like it's a window, and Titanic is slipping into the um, Belfast Lou there, right behind me. But it looks like you're actually it's right behind the window how they did it. Uh, and obviously oh, yeah. up there with the little shine rag and um but yeah that is at the Orlando Titanic exhibit 
if people are wondering where I'm showing these from, they're in the event in the in Joseph's event announcement. And that's on the bridge of the Queen Mary when I was out there in uh, back in twenty in two thousand nine. No, that was last year. That was in uh, yeah, that was in um, twenty nineteen. Two years ago almost. Yeah, I agree with Joseph. If you haven't been that was in two thousand nine, uh, when I was there for the convention. And that's my spot right there on the bridge. I I just kinda like the railing and I've been there three times now over you know, twenty years and kind of see how I age. <laughs> Oh, you look great. I was in 2009 as well. I just wanted to get a shot of the bow there with the uh, bridge and everything behind. That's a great picture. I love that picture. I remember there's a story that goes with that picture. This one back here? Yes. Um, I had set up my little 35 millimeter camera on one of the cap stands there. And I was you know, doing the timer and I was trying to get it right. And I couldn't get the shot I wanted. There was somebody up here, uh, up on the bridge area, and was looking at me, and I kept going back and forth and back. <laughs> and I think one time my camera blew over or something, and they didn't. And, and I was doing an actual little welcome video, so I was talking, and I still have these in my files. And they thought I was losing my mind or something. There's like, <laughs> thought you're talking to yourself. <laughs> Maybe some of the ghosts on Queen Mary. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I heard she was haunted. <laughs> and so what I did was, I remember walking and I was all done, and the guy's like, um, "Sir, excuse me, who are you talking to down there? Are you okay?" <laughs> like, yeah, I was just doing a little infomercial with my video camera. Oh, I, I'm sorry, I just like kind of wandering around. You're all by yourself down there, and I'm like, "Yeah, I was just taking a few publicity shots for future use and um, a little promo video for my my company." And, oh, neat! Is but, that on your website or anything? No, no, I never. Uh, oh. I didn't really look too good that day. I you didn't go of, through. You didn't go. I had really bad that. allergies that day. I, it was bad. But. Oh, and then where was this? Vegas? No, that's also in Orlando, Florida. They have a mock-up oh. staircase there. I don't think it's uh, as nice as the one I've heard. I've not seen the ones in Branson or in Pigeon Forge, but I, uh, it's still pretty nice. The ones in Branson and uh, I don't mean to take anything away. From from this uh, exhibit in Orlando, but it's uh, I think it's a little smaller. Yeah, they the have the, the uh, little piece, right? Oh, go ahead, Richard. Yeah, the the ones the one in uh, Orlando uh, Pigeon Forge, I believe, has brass railing attached to the sides, um, <laughs> and uh, it's it's not very uh, realistic because they had to uh, add add that safety railing. Um, so you can pretty much identify the uh, the Branson one from or Pigeon Forge one. I think Branson and Pigeon Forge are the same, but you can identify them with the uh, uh, because there's an extra brass ra rail on the side on the top uh, okay. to help going up. That's pretty realistic the way that 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 one is uh, is built. So um, just thought I'd throw that out there. Yeah, I think there was a discussion on Facebook once about all the, you know, checking out the accuracies of these grand staircases. Is the little was the little piece there then that piece that broke off the big piece that's in Vegas was that in Orlando? No, I don't think. Not that I remember. Not that I remember I oh yeah, you probably would have remembered if you saw. Yeah, yeah all the that stuff uh, is with RMST, and this is a separate exhibit. They're not. Oh, okay. So I don't. I heard it was somewhere in Florida, so I'm not sure. Let me see what we. Yeah, the big see. piece is out at the Luxor in Las Vegas, and it's permanently there because it's not able to. They can't physically move it out of the building anymore without yeah. going through a huge expense to do that. So it's it's going to be there till the end of time, basically. It's very touching. That's another place that you guys should go if you. Never been. And then here is our friend Tony Strublick. Yes, very talented guy. And um, I can't remember who contacted who, but I, I think he messaged me when he found out about our project through Facebook and stumbled upon our site and whatever, mutual friends and things. And uh, I believe he had offered um, to come up with a vision that we could use and show the world that this is what the potential is of Titan's uh, outward appearance. 
anyway. And uh, obviously I want Ken Marshall to be involved and he's going to be really the one that's hopefully going to put all this together once the funding can come in, uh, which I'm working on and we can discuss that. But um, Tony did uh, put this together after about, I believe, probably three or four weeks of conversations back and forth on the phone. Uh, he lent his ideas of what he could put into this uh, this uh, um, rendition, and also I put in what I felt I'd like to have, and you know, as a as a vision as well. And uh, that first, that image that you had before, that little basic drawing. Um, oh, is that the one that's one one of my? The one that you had as your background earlier. I think I have that too here in the event. Let's the actual see. drawing. Because there's uh, some. Um, this one? No, no. It, it was a, just the rough drawing that you had behind you before we went online here. I you know. Ah, sorry, guys. Phone's ringing. Decline. <laughs> um, I think that or? Not this. I thought I put. Not, is it this one? No. no. No, it was just an actual simple sketch drawing that you had behind you as your background behind you. Yeah, I think I. Uh, maybe I just need to turn off my. But, um, anyways, that was the image that he first took it. Right couple of minutes to kind of put together and that was really the first image I had you know oh here I'll turn off my I can turn off my video I think I had it up I think I had it in my, in my background my first virtual background let me switch it over this one okay can you all right I'm going to turn my screen back on this yep, that one, one. there it is this one. <laughs> That was what he first came up with after about three weeks, four weeks of talking. And he says, I'm just going to send you a simple sketch and it'll, it's not what it's going to look like, but it'll kind of give you an idea. And when I saw that, uh, I'm like, here, I'll get out of the way. <laughs> I'll just hide down here. <laughs> you go. Oh, you can still uh, see my chair. <laughs> I uh, I like that. If, you at, if you look Wait. at the, oh, where'd it go? Wait, hold on. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to send it to Richard. Let's see. Sure. Yeah, when I talk, you can see it. Um, wait, if I stop my video, is it my background? Or is that the other one? The background, yeah. You just added on there the, the actual sketch. Here, I'm going to put the other one up, and that way you guys will be able to see it. We can be creative here. I know I have it in here. I know I've got it in my file. We're so organized. <laughs> oh, this one. Here we go. All right, I'm going to make this my background picture or my profile. Okay, here we go. Can you see it now? That's it right there. Yep. Oh, so Richard might want to highlight on me there. Highlight on Jill. Oh, there we go. Okay, so that was the first one. Yeah, he did that over like within about an hour, and then he yeah. had uh, texted it to me. And I'll never forget this. I, I was working in North Dakota, in the oil field, you know, and just came in from a long night, um, hit the sack. I woke up in the morning, and that image was sitting in my phone on the messenger. Oh. And I saw that, and I literally almost teared up. And I'm like, there she is. This is what I've had in my head for all these years. I mean, I know it's, I've had some negative feedback because it's the three major decks instead of Titanic's two, but you gotta remember this ship is gonna be 15 stories tall and uh, probably uh, 1,200 and some feet long. So it's gonna be much bigger. Actually, I think the length I was planning is 1,182 feet, which is an actual 300 feet longer than Titanic was. So it's gonna be big. And I've had some people give me some negative feedback on the actual vessel itself. Well, you know, why don't they just build one just like Titanic was at 882 feet? The reasoning behind this is that Titanic was the biggest ship in history at that point and represented all the best in marine technology and safety that they thought. And so in keeping with that tradition, I felt is to bring this ship into the world, you know, once we're able to get to that point, uh, just as Titanic was, as the biggest ship in the world with the latest technology, you know, advances and um, safety.
safety features and everything else. So you have to build it big. Um, and I, you know, uh, being in Queen Mary, sorry, I had a little brain stutter there. Uh, the Carnival cruise ships dock right behind the Queen Mary at the cruise terminal there in Long Beach. And one of the Carnival ships came in and when I was on the fan tail of Queen Mary and this thing towers over the Queen Mary. Not as beautiful looking as Queen Mary, but it's bigger. And so I thought, who is gonna be impressed if we built an exact, exact replica of the Titanic at 882 feet and bring it alongside a Carnival cruise ship? The wow factor is just not gonna be there. Okay, that's what it looked like, there it is. But it's just not gonna impress people with its size as Titanic did back in its day. And so I thought the only way to do this is to go bigger. Especially with nowadays, with you know people wanting larger staterooms and trying to get as many people on there as possible. Uh, now this ship, once once it's finished, is not going to carry four or five thousand people. It's going to carry about twenty five hundred. So there's going to be plenty of room for people to enjoy the ship and not be crammed in there like sardines, like some of these uh, cruise vessels we have nowadays. So. Right, and I think I remember you were talking even with the people at Harlan and Wolf about whether that was something they would be able to. Yes, I started conversations with them initially in 1999, um, and then after the hiatus, and I came back in 2008, I started talking with them again in 2009, late 2008, early 2009, right before I went to the convention. And my contact there was David McVeigh, and he was the head of their sales and marketing team. Uh, sent a couple emails to his, to his uh, office, and um, they came up with a um, uh feasibility study type of uh, proposal to me to like what it would take to come up with this. And they were very interested in doing that. Uh, they had been in the running. I don't know if many people know that they were basically lost out on the Queen Mary II contract at pretty much the last minute. And that was due to uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, UK government backing out of a lot of these uh, financial guarantees for the yard to improve their, their uh, infrastructure and everything to take on a project of that size. And they basically left them twisting in the wind. I mean, they were so close and wow. um, the UK government balked and they backed out of the idea. And, and it really hurt Holland and Wolf at the time because they had invested a lot of their own funds into upgrading their technology from you know the CAD designs, uh, machinery shops and things like that. And plus they're probably gonna hire a whole lot more people, obviously. Um, and when that financial guarantee, those those uh, backings from the UK government failed, they lost the contract to the uh, French yard who obviously built the ship. So, um, and that was uh, not long after, I think the 2000, that was actually before that, but um, 2004 is when Queen Mary launched and uh, went into service. And so it was five years later. So they're, they were still, uh, you know, in a position to design Titan and, uh, and speaking with him over the phone, I called him uh, back in 2009, around that time, and we actually spoke uh, for uh, probably about a half an hour. And they were quite interested in the design process. They said, we have everything in place. We have all the capabilities to design the ship, but to build it, uh, they weren't in a position at that point um, without major upgrades to the yard and obviously the workforce. And so, uh, but it has been my dream and my goal to build it there where Titanic was born um, for several reasons. One, I'm part Irish and I have a, never, never been to Ireland, but it's you know, where a lot of my ancestors are from. My great grandmother was, uh, her parents were born in uh, Queenstown, which is now Cove, Ireland. I've always wanted to go back there to see the Quins, you know, and look up their history there. Uh, our family has a coat of arms there. So it's important to me to keep it in Ireland. And I know Belfast is technically, uh, you know, British territory, but um, I don't want to get into the political uh, ramifications of those uh, ideas and thoughts I have in my head. But um, I think it would, you know, in watching this movie that came out, it was a series of shows that came out around the 100th anniversary back in 2012 called Titanic Blood and Steel. And I really liked how they focused on not just the story of Titanic and how she was being built and the idea and everything. Um, but it was the actual ways of the city and the people, a lot of that background. That was some of the stuff I could have done without, but um, it really focused on the Protestant and um, Catholic divisions that have gone on there and still go on to this day. And then you throw in the fact that they're being ruled by England, you know, 
um, a lot of division and a lot of, you know, that kind of thing, a lot of angst there. And I thought that just as Lord Fury thought back then, that this project could be so much more to the city and to the country of Ireland uh, and for the people to bring these people together because a lot of these people would be working side by side to build this thing as they were back with, you know, Titanic was born. And it would be my thought, I guess, that one of the legacies of this project would be to at least try to mend some of those fences once again, um, which they've done very well the last probably 10, 12 years in doing so. A lot of the troubles are, are over now and reading my history of, of that area and the conflict. But this would be something that could really bring that area back together and um, keep them, you know, obviously employed for a good three years, too. But they're very interested in designing. As far as I know, thank God the yard was saved last fall, thanks to uh, John Wood that came in with his company, Infrastrata, to purchase the yard and keep them running. And now they're doing really well uh, with a great outlook and great uh, future, I think, going forward. And uh, I actually, uh, and they know who I am because I was trying to make an effort to purchase the yard, at least put together some sort type of a group to do that. But I only had two weeks to put that together. and. There was no way I was going to be able to pull together a financial team in that amount of time using my contacts, which I will not name, but um, it could have been done if I had more time. And the art actually sold for about $7 million, is what, which is nothing really in the business world. It was really a low amount that uh, John, uh, John Wood's company paid for that. So, um, but they know about uh, who I am and what I'd like to do. And I made it very clear that it, it's my dream. And I think it, be the best thing to have them build the liner as well as design, obviously, uh, to keep the jobs there and then create more jobs and uh, improve the economy of the area for several years to come, three years to build and keep it as our main uh, hub for um, uh, ongoing maintenance uh, for the ship and dry dock and all that. All right. Hopefully that's a good answer to your question. <laughs> Yeah, but now that they're, you know, up and running again, because yeah, I know there was a very, you know, everybody was anxious that we were going to close down, you know, and maybe they'll be able to be more prepared if you... Uh -huh. Oh, yeah, can you, I believe so. Can you explain to people what kind of changes? I know, you know, people, some people hope for like a Titanic replica, which, you know, like you said, with regulations and everything, you just can't even... That, you know you can't do it um so i'm sure you're aware of you know what you need to do and um... there's many different uh hoops that we're gonna have to go through um obviously the solas safety of life at sea regulations uh that are in place for you know passenger carrying vessels around the world and um we'll be adhering to those rules very very you know, to the t uh, once uh, things move forward and she can be built uh, my dream, obviously, and, and those, many other people. Um, so once that happens, uh, there's also another that we'll have to uh, jump through, and that's called the Jones Act. Now, that is a, a law that prohibits foreign flag vessels from carrying goods or services or people between U.S. ports. So if you're a foreign flag carrier, meaning if it's registered in another country, you cannot take a ship go from Boston to New York and transport passengers that way. You can't go from New York to Miami. Uh, you'll have to go to a foreign port, then go. So you can go from Miami to Puerto Rico and then to New York or Miami to, you know, wherever, Bermuda and then New York uh, or to, you know, Canada. You can go from Boston to Halifax to New York, but you can't go port to port carrying passengers. And so that's going to be a huge uh, thing that we have to get through because it's being built in a foreign country, uh, there's no way that any yard in the United States of America can do not capable of doing something of that size, uh, other than Navy vessels. So uh, to answer your question a little better, um, I'm hearing something in the background, I'm sorry. Um, but really, that, that's gonna be one thing we're gonna have to get through is is to have some sort of a waiver that allow us to go port to port to port carrying passengers. So uh, and I thought the only way around that would be to register the ship in the United States, whether it's New York or Boston or wherever. So There are some cruise liners right now that do have waivers. Um, and uh, they are going between 
mostly because they're going between Hawaii and uh, the Pacific mm -hmm. Coast, but they are allowed to go between like Los Angeles and San Diego and stuff like that, mainly because we don't have a yard in the United States that's big enough to uh, build cruise ships anymore, right. unfortunately. So, um, yeah, that's a, that was a big hang up with some of my stuff too, was the, uh, was the Jones Act. Um, 14 days uh, until the inauguration uh, when Joe Biden... Oh, somebody probably has the news on. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to, um, something like what's going on you know um i think maybe you know this is going to be something that's going to be very welcome after the virus scare is over because you know a lot of these cruise lines and everything uh are being shut down because of the virus and everything and so i think people are going to be looking again to this traveling on the ocean when it's safe you know um mm -hmm. So what do you need to do to bring this project to fruition? It's a very good question. <laughs> uh, basically, I built everything up through word of mouth and through advertising on Facebook, uh, marketing to people interested in the ocean liners, uh, cruising, nonprofits, and the Titanic. And that's where you know, we have a minimal amount of supporters now, uh, 15,000 roughly on Facebook, uh, where we're going to need to get that up to in the millions for this project to work and they have to be committed. Um, so my thought was is to get uh, the word out there enough where we can get uh, maybe like say James Cameron to put something on his Titanic page. If he's listening, <laughs> you know, we'll take, uh, we'll take whatever help we can get, but just a little banner ad or something to say, check out this website, look what they're trying to do. And if you support their mission, you know, like their page. Um, he has, I think, what, oh, well into the tens of millions of supporters and likes on his uh, Titanic uh, movie page. Uh, something like that where it's got a major impact where, you know, I'm a regular working guy like most people. And, uh, but I do have this vision that I really am working so hard to get done. Uh, even though we have been shut down with COVID, it's something I'm still, I still got my finger on the pulse of what's going on. I know what's going on in the cruise industry. I know what's going on in our country. Um, and, you know, the Titanic story still, there's news that makes uh, the headlines today. Uh, the latest was the controversy of going down there with these submersibles and removing the Marconi wireless from the, uh, um, from the Titanic. So, uh, and I have my personal thoughts on that, but, you know, it still is out in the field and people are interested in these things. Even today, it's been over a hundred some years uh, after the fact. And so uh, if we can get that exposure and my goal was 10 million Facebook supporters, but not only supporters, but members, if we can get them to come on board as members and we can get to it once we have our 501c3 through the U S government, the IRS here in the United States, uh, where we are allowed to take donations, uh, where we, they can write them off. Uh, we can legally take donations. They just can't write them off. Uh, but I don't want to do that. I want to make sure that people get it right off and they know that when they donate a dollar, they know where the dollar is going to go. That's very important. It's not going in my pocket. It's going right through to the foundation itself. It's going into a fund to build the ship or to sustain its operations in, in the future. Um, at least to get us to the point where it's sailing. And so with 10 million paying members, and I figured a rough, uh, you know, just a basic $5 a month. It's a couple of cans of soda, really, nowadays, right? Or a bottle, two forty nine for a little 20 liter of, of soda pop at the store. Well, it's $5 a month. If we had 10 million members giving five, $5 a month and commit to that for a 36-month period, that pays for the ship. The ship will be roughly between $1.2, $1.5 billion, uh, about the cost of a shuttle orbiter. And so it's a, it's a big investment, but once the ship is, is uh, completed, it's debt free. There are no debt payments. There's no uh, debt, debt to retire on the ship. So all the revenues that come in are subject to operational costs and obviously paying our, the CEO of the, the business unit that I'll have to hire at some point. I have an individual in mind that I would like to run this thing. Uh, very well known throughout the, um, the cruise industry and, um, his name is Tom McAlpin. He currently is the head of Virgin Cruises for Richard Branson. 
And so that is uh, something that obviously, you know, is a whole different division. Uh, but after all the expenses, there's still going to be a, a lot of profit left. As long as the people know that when they come visit this thing, we want them to have that wow factor. When they come on board, they feel like this is something that they want to continue to come back to or, or expose their friends, family, kids to, grandkids, whatever. We want this thing to perpetuate for the next 30 years upon operations, you know, on life of the vessel, at which point hopefully she'll be moored somewhere like the Queen Mary where people will have a permanent exhibit in one place where they can go visit. But uh, my goal is to bring this ship around the world and get as much exposure to people who want to know about the story of Titanic uh, as we can. And through those operations, save these kids' lives by putting millions of dollars into organizations like St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital in Memphis and other great organizations that are making serious efforts, not organizations that are putting money in their pockets, you know, through um, office costs and those fixed costs like that, where they're actually the, there's a good flow through for each dollar that actually is going to help the mission to save lives, to come up with groundbreaking discoveries on uh, vaccines or other treatments to help these kids and whatever they're battling, which is what St. Jude's works on every day, in addition to providing free health care for these children and their you know families to you know stay close by to their children as they're going through these treatments. And so that's a, a big thing for me is that this project, that money flows through. So not only are you going to go see a wonderful ship like this in any port that we can get into, whether it's LA, Seattle, New York, Boston, wherever, um, you can go see this ship, tour it, stay on board, even experience a cruise or a you know transatlantic voyage or a trans-Pacific trans -Pacific voyage. And knowing that not only are you you're paying uh, an affordable price, but that money is going to a great cause. It could be your child that we save. So, so uh, how does that work exactly? How do you become profitable enough to run a run a ship like this and have money left over for i'm sure you've thought about that i it took me two years to build a business plan for the ss titan project itself uh it, you know, granted i didn't work on it every day but in learning and studying the industry and business and nonprofits, uh the business plan i, I wrote up all the financials on it and we projected a 2.2 billion dollar surplus per year it was actually the total revenue for year one 2.9 billion dollars as long as it's marketed worldwide and we're going a worldwide cruise on its first year so we're going to go to every major port whether it's you know in hong kong to you know, tokyo london it might take us a whole year to go around the whole planet you know staying in a particular area for a week or two and moving on to the next city um the revenue is there and that's based on different marketing uh techniques and marketing uh, plans that i put together uh includes overnight stays on the ship kind of like people do on the queen mary now uh it also includes uh, voyages to nowhere where we're in a port city say we're in long beach and we pull into the cruise terminal people come on board and uh, they can go out in the ocean for about uh you know six seven hours and come back to spend a whole night on the ship the next morning we dock back in Long Beach. Uh, there's different ways to market it as well as the onboard tours. So when it's in a port, you know, when we're not uh, actively um, loading the ship for say an overnight cruise or even a you know longer cruise, maybe two or three days down to Mexico and back, whatever, however we can market this, uh, people will be able to tour it every day that we're in a port. Um, we'll be hooked up to the facilities, so the electric and water and everything will be running. So. Uh, people will be able to dine on board and experience the ship if they're too afraid to go out at sea or don't have the money to do that. You know, maybe for 35, 40 bucks, they can tour the ship as long as they want. Uh, guided tours, self, self tours, or whatever. Uh, that's a major revenue source. And I, I priced it out and, and, you know, having a group leave every 30, 40 minutes, you know, uh, the money is there. And I, it actually added up to that 2.9 billion for one straight year of operations. I couldn't believe it. So as long as people have that interest, there is that potential. Wow, thank you for explaining that. Do you want to open it up to, for questions with them? Um, sure, I shouldn't ask all the questions in case people here are wanting to. So put right in the chat or wave your hand or um, there's a little button where you can, if anybody has any questions for Joseph. I, I have one. Okay. 
Um, well, actually, it's a, it's two. Um, are were you familiar with the uh, American Freedom Train that went through in 1976? Yes, actually, that that's interesting. You brought that up. Um, I remember that summer it had come to the Twin Cities in Minneapolis, St. Paul, and I do remember this. My friend, my my father was good friends with Hubert Humphrey, our former vice president, obviously Minnesota. Uh, senator and um, everything, um, mayor of Minneapolis. So he, he knew him quite well. Talked about him all the time when I was growing up. But Hubert Humphrey was on the American Freedom Train as the guest uh, honorary conductor when they pulled into the uh, Minnehaha Station in South Minneapolis, which is where we all went to see the the, the American Freedom Train. Not many people know about this. I, that was really cool. You brought that up, Richard. And so I did get to go on the, the train and see all the items on board. It was, it was incredible, you know, seeing Lincoln's top hat and the podium that JFK used to, during his 1961 presidential inauguration. So there was so many wonderful things, you know, the, some items from space, from the moon landing. So, yeah, I remember that quite well. Yeah, because that's kind of what I was thinking of when you were talking about going from port to port is almost having a, a, a traveling museum as well, you know, that that people could you know i mean because the titanic exhibit when it went through mm -hmm. um i i was lucky enough to go see it in denver and uh i took a virtual tour with some friends uh when this covid thing broke out of the one in uh in las vegas and um i i think that would be also a great uh thing to include is the uh, yes. is having having a uh, uh, you know, because people are interested in that stuff, and that's a reason alone to come see the shed. And that, that's something that uh, obviously I've thought of. Um, people have brought that up too. Um, so that is a really good suggestion. And that's something that I think I may have discussed with Jill um, and a few others is that once it's built and we're ready to go, uh, I would like to incorporate a very large room uh, on that, that ship. I'm sorry, I'm trying to phone call coming in here, sorry about that, um, to incorporate a, a very large room that's dedicated to the passengers who were lost on Titanic where their names will be etched in the walls of this room and maybe a little story on each, a little uh, brass plaque underneath that uh, uh, tells a little bit about their background to honor each one. If there's a picture of, of these people, if we can get those. Uh, obviously not only the most famous people who we all know their stories, uh, from John Jacob Astor and Molly Brown and others, but to the the simple person who was on board traveling, if there's any there, there are stories that exist, and um, the late Phil Gowan, uh, who I communicated with regularly, and unfortunately I didn't get the chance to go meet him um, as he was you know getting more into his uh, battle, uh, and he lived right down in Corsicana here, south of Dallas where I'm at, and uh, but he had I believe one of the biggest uh, you know collections of um backgrounds on all the passengers that was you know what he dedicated his life to is to learning the stories of each person that he could and that would be something to try to figure out where those files are that that he left behind uh, in care of somebody uh, i don't know who but i'm sure i could find out uh, i know of somebody who knows who has those files but if they would come forward at that point if they want to incorporate that into this uh, museum as, a, as an honor to those people who are lost and uh, also saved as well but mostly to those lost, uh, they're the ones who uh, suffered the most. Um, to remember them and to bring that to the world, uh, that would be important, as well as maybe some items from uh, that era and, and from Titanic. If people want to donate those, we're certainly going to be very well open to that. And uh, whether you know they want to donate um, on a short-term basis on loan or they want to keep it a permanent exhibit on board, if they want to leave their item on there, that's fine too. So. But that's something that's very important to me. We want to make this room very spectacular yet. Uh, one that honors us, not too glitzy and glamorous, but something that um, people are going to want to visit and make it a focal point of that tour aboard the ship. Well, that's uh, that's excellent. I uh, I was also just thinking of, uh, you said the latest and greatest technology um, yes. uh, on the ship and uh, it'd be interesting to compare uh, some of the stuff that was compared to stuff that what is. And it's really interesting because there's a lot of uh, 
marine technology that has not changed uh, mm. over the years. Um, you know, watertight doors are still watertight doors. I mean, some of them are open are operated uh, hydraulically instead of with um, mm. the uh, gravity. But uh, and I'm a radio guy. I mean, I'm I'm an extra class ham radio operator and have been mm. in radio all my life. So um, the leaps and bounds that we have made in radio communications and electronics and stuff since 1912 uh, just absolutely fascinates me. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it'd really be neat to to see and compare and, and all that kind of stuff. One of the um, interesting things, and this was Ken Marshall's idea when we actually were talking about this. Uh, when I first met him that evening was, I believe, April 2nd. There was a... And, and, uh, Ellen, you remember this, uh, you were there, um, I believe it was in the Queen Salon and the Queen Mary, and it was just a casual meet and greet the night before we actually started the convention, and uh, Ken was there, and I thought I'd get maybe five minutes of his time, and we ended up talking for an hour and a half, <laughs> so, um, and he was totally enthralled with the idea, and, uh, and so in one of the discussions we had was, and now this was before I had this wonderful uh, concept from Tony Strublick to to show the world of this is what the potential is of this ship. This is what she could look like and in many respects probably will look like uh, other than what Ken will probably add or uh, detract from that drawing and, and into his own creation because that he's going to be the master of this design. That's my goal and my the way I would like to honor him and this is going to be his baby. Uh, so uh, what he came up with is because of the solace regulations, we have to have the lifeboats closer to the water. And as you can see on the, the uh, picture, I don't know if Jill, if you can switch back to the other drawing on there. Are you still with us, Jill? Give me a second. I'll, I'll put it up for you. Cause she and uh, yeah, that shows them very clearly on that. Now I see we have Bradley, Lee, and Hugh. Uh, I'm sorry, I've been looking at uh, the camera here, but thank you for coming and sitting in with us this afternoon. I know it's an early and, day. Uh, Judy just joined us. Hello, Judy. Hi, Judy. I don't see you on my screen, but I see a little box here. Thanks for stopping hey. in. Hi. <laughs> I had to hurry home. Oh, we had a little later start today because I had a shot in my arm. I'm, I'm pretty sore right now. So I ran a little late and then I got soaked riding my motorcycle home, so, <laughs> oh, been a great day, sorry. <laughs> sorry, I had to get a drink, I'm getting a little dry mouth there. Well, that's awesome. Um, yeah, I, I really enjoy uh, listening to this, I'm- uh, well, thank you. Thank Jill, you. Jill took a took a little break, so I'm going to try okay. and go in here. Um, well, there's there is the image. If you look in images up, you can find them. But um, uh, what Tony did was he put the lifeboats much closer to the water as regulations require. Uh, but what Ken came up with was some sort of a hydraulic uh, system where we could put these large metal plates doors. To cover those lifeboats so when it's sailing you won't be able to see them and then in an emergency uh obviously you may lose electrical power so they'd be there'd be in a hydraulic latch system where you could just pull down a, a big bar and those doors would fly up based on hydraulic pressure um and so then they, you'd be able to launch your lifeboats in an emergency hopefully that would never happen but uh, we all know these things do happen at, at some point in time and you know whether it's a fire or a storm or something else we have to get everybody off the ship so um yeah that was a great idea and then ken had come up with that so uh, i would like to get another rendition of titan made maybe just even a close-up of just that section of the ship that maybe tony can do or at some point ken will do with his idea but to kind of show maybe some of the doors open you know and some closed so you can kind of see the concept that it'll look the hull will look uh, seamless, but then right underneath those doors, you have all the lifeboats and everything in there. So that was a wonderful idea that he came up with. And he had some other great ideas as well. So 
know if I can remember a couple of them. Well, I, I don't think that that's uh, unreasonable either. Uh, I mean, Disney got a uh, a uh, waiver on their lifeboat colors um, because the uh, soulless regulations and all that said bright orange, you know, international orange, and um, uh, Disney Cruise Line was able to get in and have the lifeboats changed to their Mickey Mouse yellow. So uh, there's still high visibility, but uh, um, you know the idea of, of doors is is uh, is great because that was one thing I did not really like about what um, was going on with the uh, other Titanic too uh, was the um, the the lifeboats uh, piercing through the hull like that. Um, and, uh, it, you know, really, it is impossible to do an exact recreation of the Titanic in this exactly. day and age, um, you know, with what solace regulations are with fire and, and uh, you know, the wood trim. Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff. Cruise ships look like cruise ships because, you know, they can't put a lot of, of that fancy stuff in because of um you know mainly the fire regulations that came up with uh solace 2010 uh mm -hmm. which is a shame but um as i mentioned earlier before um you know you could easily do plaster uh casts of the woodwork and mm -hmm. uh you know paint them uh you know and really it would with the techniques that we have in paint and everything else it'd be hard to hard to tell uh close up what it is yeah, I mean, if you look at even the sets of Titanic um, down in Mexico, which Ken Marshall was so heavily involved in designing uh, for the um, for the the workers that you know put all that together, I mean, it's Titanic. I mean, even Ken Marshall said that this I, he can't refer to it as as anything else but Titanic that movie set. Oh, exactly. Uh, and so it can be done, and he'd actually mentioned too. Uh, I believe this is out there on the Titanic Historical Society's. Uh, uh, forum board uh, from 2009. He actually wrote about our meeting and, and some of the ideas of, of us. And I, I can't tell you what that meant to me personally that he posted about our meeting and, and what was discussed. Um, right, I was talking to my best friend, my my partner in this, one of the two partners I have, um, but he's my vice uh, vice chairman, uh, Ronald Rust. Um, he's had some issues uh, back in Minnesota which is where he lives. And uh, so he kind of stepped away from the project, but is still the vice chairman and, um, you know, he'll probably step forward, you know, at that time, he's kind of not too good with the limelight thing. So, you know, being out there, I, I guess I have to be the face of this. It is my original idea anyway. So uh, at least the one pushing it, I mean, a lot of people want to do this thing and, you know, for whatever reason, but um I had told him about our meeting and he was almost like he didn't believe me. Like I showed him the pictures, like we talked so many times and he was a great guy. He's like, I ain't probably got a picture taken with him, you know, but then when Ken wrote about it and I, which I didn't know for five months after the fact uh, in, in 2009, I was blown away and I was like, wow. You know, he, he really gave us a decent boost with that to some of the membership of THS. And uh, that was just such an honor for me to, even be in that position, being a regular person, you know, and uh, doing this, you know, not for any type of personal gain or anything like that, or any type of ego. It's just a matter. I want to save lives of these kids. I had a, a really close childhood friend die from leukemia at six years old. I didn't even know what that was. Here one day, gone the next. Fell, you know, he went in his sleep, and so that always stayed with me. Uh, my friend Ricky, and so I see these kids, you know, I think a big part of it was watching these late night programs and they'd have these uh, sick kids on these shows or these infomercials and it just stabs you in the heart. Whereas most of us have led pretty decent lives. If we lived to 50, 60, we've done pretty good, right? And these kids are fighting these horrible diseases and they're five, six years old, 10, whatever. It's not right. And I think we can do something as long as we can provide funding that goes to real research. To, I mean, look, they supposedly come up with a COVID vaccine within a, what, a month or two? Why can't we focus on uh, some of these childhood 
you know, blood cancers, leukemia, or cancers. You know, what will it take to do that? How much will it take in terms of financial uh, expenditures to get that done? And so that's, if I can at least make a small dent in that with this project, with the help of the world and people who believe in what I'm doing, and not only that, to build a wonderful, magnificent ship and enjoy that and remember the people who were lost because that's the reason why the ship's being built in the first place. There was no Titanic disaster and people didn't unfortunately pass away. We wouldn't be doing this. I wouldn't even be involved in anything like this. So that's important. It's saving these kids' lives. And that's number one with me. And that's what keeps me driving forward. I think that's wonderful. Um, we had a question from you. Uh, yeah. And it says, even though the ship will be bigger, when it still look, uh, will it still look like Titanic? And when will it stay when it's not sailing? I'd switch over to him, but he's got a cat on his chest. And, uh... <laughs> I think it's too cute. Yeah, I didn't know if that was a cat or a dog. Or a cat. It's really big in the picture. Okay, there's a cat. Yep, I see him. <laughs> Hello, so... Mr. Watt. Um, okay, I, I, got, I got the second part. I'm sorry. The first part was, uh, will it look like Titanic? Yep. But having Ken Marshall involved... Um, at some point as a, as a consultant, um, uh, yes, I think it'll look as close to Titanic as we possibly can. But yet, when you look at what Tony Strebler came with, came up with, with my assistance and my vision as well, uh, the bow is a little different than Titanic's straight, almost straight prow. It has a little bit more of a Queen Mary feel to it. And that is another thing that I'm trying to incorporate in the ship, not only the outward appearance of Titanic, obviously there'll be some changes, not too much. You'll still see Titanic in the superstructure and, and the hull, you know, um, compared to today's cruise ships. It's going to look like an ocean liner. It's going to have the portholes. It's going to have round porthole glass. Uh, but it will uh, have some little subtle changes that remind us of other liners, like Queen Mary as a nod to the greatness of that ship, or Normandy, and some of the, maybe the interior rooms that we're going to do, which are going to be so fantastic and, and huge, which are different than Titanic. But it's kind of a, an homage to all those great liners, but obviously Titanic first and foremost. So, But uh, with Ken being involved and with what uh, Tony has come up with, with my minor assistants, he's a wonderful artist. I couldn't even, I can't draw for anything. So, um with Ken being involved, he's really going to make this thing come alive. And that's what I'm looking forward to now. I don't think I can afford Ken's commission right now to, to start work on that at this point, but I hopefully if he's still uh, seriously interested in becoming involved. And I haven't heard anything that he hasn't been. I, I'm sure I'd be messaged on that. Uh, basically he told me when you have the funding and you're ready to go forward, let's talk. So that's kind of where we're sitting at with him. Uh, but it will look very much like Titanic as far as we can with modern technology and, and the regulations that are involved as well to even be allowed to sail, like like you said, Richard, the Solus regula regulations. Um, oh, and the other, the other half of that question was where will it be? Uh, our plan is to keep sailing year round. Uh, obviously, in the winter, we'll try to go to the southern ports. Um, there will be obviously times where she'll have to be dry docked and maintenance will be done and that'll all be done in Belfast at uh, Harlan Wolf if in fact they build her. Uh, it'll also be its uh, a provider of maintenance and upgrades as well. I think that hopefully answers that. You? Awesome. Jill, are you back? You're back? Wow. That is, that's great. Does anybody else have any other questions? Trying to look at Joseph, it. thank you. I love your passion. And um, Joseph, over the years, has shared with me his business plan. It's completely solid. It's, um, you know, I just love the mission because it's um, not just Titanic enthusiasts that are affected here. You know, it's um, people like Joseph said, you know, childhood cancer. You know, I've, I've lost children in my life, life and know people that struggle. And when you look at like the Can American Cancer Society, they give just as a minimal amount of money to children for some reason. And um, a lot of it goes towards administrative costs. Like, uh, it, and I'm going to go out and say it, like March of Dimes uh, is one organization where they have a decent mission, 
but a lot of the money from each dollar goes towards administrative costs. And that's just not right. Whereas uh, if you donate to St. Jude's, I think uh, it, it's a really large majority of that dollar goes to the actual efforts that they're doing and their mission, which they say they're gonna do. So that's why I um, really wanna get behind them. And um, in the- So what can we do? Is tell your friends, tell your family. Is there anything that we can do? Check out the Facebook page, like their page, uh, spread it, send it to 10 different friends, 20, whatever. Get that word out there because we need every single person we can get. And um, But we have uh, here at the foundation that uh, we being my partners, um, Ron and, and another person I, I can't name. But um, anyway, the uh, funding has been a large issue, obviously. We're a nonprofit. We need to have donations. Well, we're not set up from a 501c3 point right now we can give a, um, a deduction on that here in the United States anyway. So I decided not to take any donations uh, as of this point until we get that 501c3 and until we have something concrete to show the world to where we can get to a point where we have the design. And I'd like to get that done by the end of this year or early next. And I know I keep pushing that back, but now we're in the age of COVID. So it's, it's pretty hard to you know, just do those types of things that we would normally do. Uh, initial design with Harlan and Wolf is going to be right around 250000 Not a great amount, but to most regular working people, it is a large amount of money. So I'm trying to get that funded uh, by the end of the year. Um, I have a few individuals I'll be targeting on that as well. And if we can get that done, uh, I know some people who work on models. And if we can... And uh, just to back up on that initial design, um, I would like to have Ken involved in that as well. So he can kind of walk through with uh, Hound and Wolf's architects to come up with uh, really decent uh, and accurate deck plans for Titan based on Titanic's uh, inward and outward appearance. So you'll have a, an actual deck plan. Uh, we'll have a, a rough idea probably within a uh, maybe a 70 to 80% confidence of what it'll actually look like on completion. Um, now the actual plans, they're a little more expensive. Those are about probably six, $7 million nowadays to come up with. And then that's what they'll use to actually start cutting the steel and, you know, really getting into the heavy duty machinery of building this thing. So, but the initial plans just give you a, an outline of the decks, what will be on those decks as far as public spaces and layouts of uh, state rooms and things like that, what our eventual capacity will be, machinery on board, what will power this thing, uh, whether they're diesel, electric engines, or something that's environmentally friendly. It'll have everything in there in initial plan phase, and I'd like to have Ken involved in that. And based on those, you know, it'll really show what her outward appearance will actually be at that point. And so that's something I'd like to get done either by the end of this year or early next year. Um, but there is something that I came up with. Uh, the biggest thing is funding. Um, people just aren't going to donate to something that's just an idea or a dream. And so uh, I formed an, a for-profit company here. Uh, I think we incorporated in 2017 or no, 2018. We incorporated in, uh, in Minnesota, and that's called uh, Titan Productions. And my idea was to put on a music festival originally in Minnesota, but I'm now leaning towards Dallas here because they have a larger facility and it's uh, obviously increases our revenue potential. But uh, this festival would feature the biggest names in music, uh, in pop and, and rock music um, today, and also have a secondary weekend, which would have the biggest country singers in the industry as well. And these would be two four-day festivals, Thursday through Sunday over consecutive weekends here in, in Dallas at the Cotton Bowl, which is where I'm targeting right now. Uh, it would go worldwide on a worldwide pay-per-view broadcast. Uh, I have worked very hard over the last couple of years on this. All the people and uh, pieces I need to do this from uh, staging to sound and video to facilities to security to um, ticketing. I mean, everything that's involved in this that needs to be done People are in the loop, especially the pay-per-view, which uh, is a company called World Vision. I've talked to um, their owner, actually, about this. And so he was suggesting this, uh, even if I had half of the lineup that I was planning on having, uh, it would sell out. So, and he could market that 
to all the cable and satellite providers uh, around the world to cover this like, a worldwide event. And so we're going to utilize that platform to inform the world of Titan. You know, this is where a lot of the funding is going to go to from this event, in addition to funneling it right into St. Jude's immediately from that show, from the from those a series of shows. Uh, and the revenue potential of this event is uh, roughly half a billion dollars when you include the uh, pay-per-view potential, which he feels he could sell six million units worldwide at $79.95 a pop. That's over $400 million right there. Um, you take out your expenses, uh, leaves us with about $200 million. That's more than enough to get Titan started and help nonprofits and also local agencies too with their uh, needs for helping the people in the local areas that we're, we're actually serving here in Dallas and in Minneapolis, St. Paul. So uh, that is really is gonna be the uh, financial vehicle to kickstart Titan to move us from dream to the reality stage where we can actually build and start putting this together with an initial $50 million payment to Han and the Wolf and get this thing going. And I'm very excited about that. And I know that once COVID goes away and we get back to normal here and we can continue our lives as we have, um, I really feel that the world is going to want something like, this, especially here in the U.S. People have been craving going out to a live music venue and seeing their favorite bands again. Uh, I can't name names, uh, but it'll be the biggest uh, in the industry. Uh, A-list performers uh, that we're planning on targeting to sign and do this show. So that is something that uh, is taking up a lot of my time. But I also feel that once it is a uh, you know, in place and it's successful. I think that we have a real good shot of getting tight into construction, hopefully within a year after the show. Well, they did it with Live Aid, so uh, I don't yes. see any reason why not. Um, have you also thought about um, other uses besides the, um, or, or, or secondary mission, uh, such as, uh, using some of the space in the ship to uh, deliver like humanitarian aid to some of the uh, far oh, yeah. places and uh, also perhaps providing onboard medical care for, for kids in some of the impoverished countries. Uh, they've got the hospital ships that are floating around that, that do that and uh, there's a, a need for more of that. Um, so, yes. yeah, uh, that is an excellent question, Richard. And uh, it's something that I have thought about uh, not a whole lot because you know, let's just get the thing going first and kind of let the chips fall where they may after we're, we're at that point. But um, that is something that uh, was brought up by Ken, actually, uh, because the ship is so large. Uh, we're talking 1,182 feet long proposed, uh, about 128 to 130 feet wide. It's, there's a lot of volume in there, and a lot of it, uh, because we don't have the large engines that Titanic had, you know, they're, they're much smaller and fit in the smaller spaces, that we're going to have a lot of areas down there. So one of his ideas was to use some of the extra space for recreations. So having a recreated triple expansion engine on board Titan, so you can kind of see this is how big they were. You know, this is how they worked. Um, I don't know if it'll be and maybe made out of some type of... Uh, you know, fiberglass material or something just for show, just to show, but it'll look as realistic as anything. Uh, it just won't be actual you know, working uh, item. But um, but then again, maybe we can make it work where it's actually turning and looks like it's operating. So uh, it's just something that he had come up with and that, that sounded like a good idea. But it, what you said about bringing these, this aid and maybe even having some medical facilities on board, say if we visit South Africa or somewhere you know, where we don't have pirating going on. I don't think we're going to go in, in the area of Somalia at all, but um, <laughs> something maybe where they can bring them to another country where they have a port. Certainly we'll uh, look into maybe providing um, a medical staff that could help these kids. And obviously we'll have a large cargo area to bring supplies over from the U.S. if we're out to go there. And it'd also be available in emergencies, in, in worldwide emergencies, whether there's a you know, a catastrophe like we had the tsunami in uh, 2004, I believe it was, in the, in the year in um, Malaysia. Uh, definitely, we would uh, uh, use that vessel to assist in whatever way we can. It'll also be, you know, like I said, it's a ship of light and hope. So 
for those types of things, it is a great idea to bring that. And I didn't actually think of having medical staff on board to treat people, but definitely it's something we can put on. And it's a great idea, Richard. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Um, yeah, uh, another question. Uh, I'm not exactly familiar with the specifications, but um, is this going to be a Panamax uh, ship? You're going to be able to go through the canal with it? Um, uh, no, uh, we'll have to go around like as from going from the east coast to west coast of America, for for example, we'll have to go all around Cape Horn. You know, so. so it's going to be it, it's going to be bigger than Panamax. So yes, yeah, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> pretty sure, <laughs> pretty sure. Yeah, we won't be able to get through the Panama Canal at all. No. Okay, that was that was a uh, another question that I had. Thank you. Yeah, and that will lead to other port calls, the Rio de Janeiro, or uh, all along the coast of South America, where I don't know exactly where all the ports are down there, but um, certainly to, to get them to, to see the ship as well. I mean, this would be a worldwide marketable uh, ship. So. Cool. Wow. Anybody else have anything they want to add or say? Oh, let me see. Okay. And my Paul, my Paul, every hundred percent said they would sail on Titan. That is great to hear. And like I said, it's going to be affordable for for all. That's one of the biggest things that I'm trying to look at is there'll be something for everybody on board. If they're if they want to learn about the history of the great ocean liners, learn about Titanic story on, uh, as well, obviously, and uh, experience a, a wonderful piece of maritime technology. That this is going to be the place to go. And what I want people to really feel when they walk on board this ship is like uh, as long as you donated even if it's a dollar this is your ship and we want you to be welcome on board at any time and when you come on board and you walk through those doors into that entryway we want you to feel like you don't want to leave <laughs> so and that's the big thing is you have to get them on that first visit because you only have that one opportunity so are you going to have like a little museum inside or are you going to have like, yeah. you know, like Titanic Belfast, like, you know, each room is like representing something. Like there will be different ideas. And me and Richard, you had stepped away. We had talked about that, um, about having a Titanic museum on board. That is one thing we definitely will have. Yes. And yeah, as far okay. as uh, other ways we can do it, uh, I would like to sell as much as I can within reason so it's you know done tactfully uh say the portholes we would like to sell the portholes to people who can donate to help fund the ship uh so maybe it might be a little more expensive maybe for a couple thousand dollars or, or more you can have your name etched in or even around the porthole you know that and that would be their portal will always be on the ship. Oh, that would be cool. Sign me up. Yeah, I got that. <laughs> that is a pretty good idea. And I had the idea from Robert Schuler. I don't know if you're familiar with the Dr. Robert Schuler. Uh, maybe Ellen is, and she's right down there. Um, he had a, a, a TV show on for years called Hour of Power, and he was a, a, a minister out there at the uh, Crystal Cathedral in uh, Garden Grove, California. It's still there. Um, they went towards the end there. They had some difficulties and there was some squabbling and stuff. But uh, I used to watch that show every morning. Every Sunday morning, my mom would want to watch that show. And we actually met him. He did a little tour and came to St. Paul back in 1978. And I remember shaking his hand. <laughs> so I felt, you know, of all those TV ministries and a lot of those, you know, the bakers and some of those others were just so fake. You know, they just wanted money. This guy actually, I believe, believed in what he was doing. And he had this big vision of building the Crystal Cathedral, and he asked for donations through his television program. He wasn't asking for a jet liner or a jet, you know, jet plane. He wasn't asking for fancy houses and stuff. This guy started out as a minister by standing on top of his car, or I think it was on top of the roof of the drive-in theater, every Sunday morning preaching his message to people who would show up in their cars at the drive-in movie theater in Southern California and grew that ministry to the Crystal Cathedral we see today. If you go out there to Southern California, you can see it. 
But what he did when he was selling this idea of building this wonderful building is that he sold the glass panels, you know, with that same idea where they were etched with the people's names. And I thought that was a wonderful idea for Titan because it's going to have hundreds of portholes. And we sold each one at 2000 or 2500 or 5000 or whatever. We could raise a lot of money. So we'll get to that point where they'll be on sale and you can have your name etched in the portal glass. And, uh, you know, it's a permanent memorial and, and honor to those people who want to donate and help the ship and the cause. So I got that from Dr. Robert Schuller. <laughs> Awesome. Sounds like you've got a lot of great people in your corner. And um, there's a. I've been fortunate enough to meet a lot of the people from the movie Titanic and others, and uh, uh, just average people to. Oh, he is he. Really important people, and I. I value their opinions. I value their insight, and I really value their support if they believe in what this is. And I, the one thing I've always thought about, and it's actually been asked of me. Uh, was, you know, one, why are you doing this? And, but the, the one thing is, is when you're raising the money for this, and we'll get to that point, uh, if you ask somebody for a large gift, you know, to get this going or something, and I, I haven't done that yet to any individual, I've, I've sent out a few proposals that haven't gone my way for whatever reason, uh, mostly financial, it's, it's a lot of money. But, the big thing I keep thinking about, and I've actually been asked this or, or told this, how can you say no to a project like this that's going to save lives? How do you say no to sick kids? And that's one thing. I how do you say no to that? Okay, so then with that in mind, are you going to be like, uh, you know, those organizations that make a wish foundation? Are you going to have like a special suite for these kids so they can just come for free and get out, you know, have a vacation with their family. Yeah. I mean, that, that brings up another great idea, you know, where make a wish where these children want to do something. I mean, I don't know. If, I think several of them are terminally ill, unfortunately. So they want to give them just one good day, whether it's um, going, uh, you know, to Disneyland or, you know, just something that kids love to do. And I'm sure we're going to get kids that want to go on the ship. I mean, we're going to be well marketed. We're going to be well known. Um, if we grow our organization to that level of bringing in that kind of revenue, um, we'll be the fourth largest nonprofit in the United States after United Way, Red Cross, and I think one other. Fourth largest. So that's pretty big. Um, so we'll be able to reach a lot of people, a lot of these kids. And so, yes, we'll, we'll have uh, special areas that will be reserved for uh, these children and um and like yeah. doctors on board in case they, I worked at a summer camp for a few years. I went down to Florida and the whole idea was a completely free vacation for these families and their kids to come and, you know, just get away from it all. And um, we just That's took care of everything for them. And, you know, because it is very high stress for the whole family to go. And That's something we could probably work out amongst uh, uh, the executives at St. Jude's. Um, they're, they're uh, top people once you know we form that partnership uh, where we're really not asking anything from them other than being involved in their marketing and any marketing they do you know proud uh, partner of SS Titan Foundation with our logo whatever um, but they could have these rooms that maybe they'll run and let their families come on board if their child is well enough to travel and take a transatlantic voyage you know once in a lifetime thing or flying back whatever uh, those are things, you know, we can run it by a lottery system. So everybody has an equal chance um, and have these rooms available for every voyage we do. And even if they just want to come on board, certainly they'll be free. We won't charge a, a dime to somebody who's um, you know, truly uh, fighting a, a serious you know, disease. Very important to us. Yeah, because maybe you could even collab, do some collaboration with like the Make-A-Wish Foundation where they Make -A -Wish as well. help, you know, help support this cause because they, it's a really good they movie also do that. fundraising for kids. It's a very good movie that, I, that came out recently and I watched it and I didn't know what it was about. It's called Wish Man. I don't know if anybody's familiar with it. Watch that movie. Wish Man. Wish Man. True story. Just watch it. I'm not going to give anything else than that. Just watch that movie. And you could probably find it on maybe on Netflix or certainly on some type of uh, streaming service. But uh, it is, it brought a tear to my eye. 
So right now you're just asking for exposure. That's all you're. We're just trying to get the word out. Um, right now I'm I'm kind of in I'm being a hermit, <laughs> like most people right now, trying to yeah. let the COVID storm blow over us here in the world. And uh, but doesn't mean I'm not actively trying to continue to keep in touch with people out there. Um, our supporters, 15,000 of them on Facebook and other people as well. And your fine group here, you have over 2,000 members, I believe. I, I just want to show them that I'm a, a caring individual that has this big dream and uh, that we're making roads to, you know, inroads to make those dreams come true. And we need all your support. It means a lot. I mean, every single person is important. And uh, once we get to the point where we're raising funds, looks like I'm going to have to form this this uh, this um, concert event to you know put my funding into it and then hopefully after that point once the world sees that Titan is being actually put together physically then we'll have that opportunity to uh, take donations to, to help pay off that ship because I'll provide the initial amount but then we'll need everybody else to fill in the gap and that's going to be a big gap but it'll belong to everybody and you'll be doing it for a great cause so that's what we're looking forward to just and that's my whole goal right now is just to keep People know, uh, just let them know that I'm still here. We're still here. So will you come back and meet with us again when you have more Anytime news you like to share, to when you want something new, you know, from us? And I will, I keep regular updates on our Facebook page and our website. Uh, I'd obviously like to improve our website uh, into uh, something much more than it is now. It's something I actually put together. And, you know, like I said, we're, I'm a regular working guy and the funding is tight. But once the, you know, I have a little bit more wherewithal, hopefully by the end of this year, I'll definitely be improving that big time. And, um, but I put all the latest updates of what's going on with the idea. If there's anything people want to add, they're welcome to send a message through uh, Facebook on Messenger to the foundation or through the website. Sign up. If you believe in what we're doing, we need all that support. So if you sign up through uh, our Facebook page or our website um, and be added to our mailing list, uh, uh, we need that support, so we really appreciate it. And we do have your page and your website on in the, our event, but I'll also put your website here, sstitan.org, if people want to. And you also have a newsletter list where people could, you know, put their email in. Yes. I haven't been too active on that blog recently. Like, it's probably last year was the last post I did um, regarding the partnership with Titan Productions, which is, of course, my own company as well. But uh, that is, that's going to be our funding vehicle. And that was probably the last post I put on here to kind of share that as well. Wow, great. This is fantastic. And Are there any more questions? Thank you so from, much. From our, yeah, is there any more? I think Alan's, Alan's waving. I'm going to unmute. I just wanted to make sure I said thank you so much, Rick. Joseph, I really appreciate seeing you again, and hopefully I get to see you again in person soon. I'll definitely be out there this year um, once I get the company going here with my trucking operation in uh, May, June in that area. I'll be definitely coming to California. I'll, I'll be the master where I go. All right. so definitely come out and spend hopefully a, a couple more days with you and Judy out there and whoever else is going to be out there. All right, I'm going to unmute everybody if everybody wants to say goodbye or thank you or anything. Hello, <laughs> hello, um, Joseph, it's Bradley speaking. Hello. How are you? <laughs> he said, how are you? <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm great. Uh, it's a little rainy here in Dallas, Texas, but we're doing okay. Yeah. Well, it's actually... Um, it's, it's about, oh, let me see, I'll tell you what time it's in, in Australia at the moment. Uh, we have 3.40 here. here, so I know you're the down. time here is actually um, uh, 8.44 a.m. Thursday oh, morning. Early morning for you. Thank you for getting up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, your, your, hang on. I was so glad uh, I made it home to see you. <laughs> oh, thank you, Judy. <laughs> yeah, I can't thank you for coming. Uh, uh, and I, I actually think this has a, has a great shot with all the uh, interest that has been in uh, Palmer's ship and especially the replica in China uh, floating through the groups. Um, 
Uh, I know that once you get momentum, are you kidding me? Stop! It's gonna be it's gonna be pretty uh -oh. good. Hang on. Uh, I am muted. Yeah, <laughs> but well, yeah, I, I think this is gonna be this is gonna be great because it's gonna it's gonna really take off. Um, like I said, especially all the people that had interest in Palmership and and uh, the one in China. So, if I may, just add one quick thing. Um, when the Palmer idea came out in 2012, uh, we had already been incorporated as a nonprofit for four years at that time, and uh, obviously I'd met everybody, you know, at, at the THS convention and uh, had built the website and everything. So we had done a lot of groundwork when that news came out. Again, it was like that was the second time this has happened now, where somebody came forward with this idea to build something like this. And in reading everything he was trying to do, it, it, it really kind of, you know, boiled my blood a little bit, um, mainly because he didn't mention anything about giving back to the world. And with something like this, it's a very sensitive subject. And I've talked to certain family members uh, of survivors um, and read on their positions on, on this. They don't want it. They don't want somebody making money off of their relatives passing away in this tragedy. So that's something that's very sensitive to a lot of people. Uh, even people were even sensitive to the movie coming out and where's all that money going. And so I'm going to give James Cameron a pass on that because what he did with that movie is put Titanic on the map and he meant well with what he was doing. And he used that fund, uh, some of that money to go back and do the Ghost of the Abyss special, as Judy and Helen both know very well. Judy, you were in that. And so, uh, you know, he has done just uh, more than anybody, I think, has done to really bring that story alive for us with the movie and with Ghosts of the Abyss to, to do the exploration of the ship itself. Very important. But I, uh, I just totally disagree with Clive Palmer's uh, idea because he has not mentioned anything about giving back in any way, shape, or form to help anybody with other than lining his pockets. That's just not what I'm trying to do here at all. Yeah. Oh, and I really love hearing your story. I'm glad you got to talk with everyone here. And um, I wish yeah, we we'll put this. <laughs> I know. Well, it's probably people are at work. I know. <laughs> we'll do it again. And then we'll get, you know, people will watch this. We'll put it out in the newsletter and yep. um, we'll get more exposure. Because I think a lot of it, too, is that there's just so many Facebook groups and so much going on. I think people just can't keep an eye on something that people don't want to. Do. Really yeah, up. people are probably at work, and but we, I, I love you. I think you're awesome. You uh, so Joseph was there for me when I can vouch for his caring, compassionate nature. When my cancer came back, he was right there, being a, a great friend. And um, I think, you know, we we definitely need to encourage the the goodness and that can happen in the world. And why not, you know, bring a whole bunch of Titanic enthusiasts to do something you know, wonderful. Um, J Sonia wrote, I believe James Cameron invested the profit from the movie to, oops, it bumped off, um, to future expeditions to bring the story alive. It does seem like James Cameron's really still very... Oh, Bob Ballard at, Bob Ballard at this point. You know, he's... Those are those are my three biggest heroes. You got to get James Cameron on their email list. <laughs> I'm not sending an invite. <laughs> Excuse me. I would love to hear from James Cameron. What did you say? I missed it. Uh, I was told once. Uh, yeah, you don't find that. James Cameron; he finds you. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there was a story yeah. about that with uh, yeah, well, maybe Marshall. he'll find. If you'd like, I'd share that. I'd share, share that story about Ken Marshall and and uh, how he came about. To be involved in the project, I don't know. If oh knows. yes, I'm. I'm. I'm going to stick around. When we met, I'm sure he wouldn't mind if I shared it. But, you know, but uh, uh, when the news had come out and he had found out through the grapevine, like most of us, that James Cameron was going to do this movie. And I don't know if you're familiar with the fact that uh, Ken Marshall had a previous association with uh, James when he did the matte painting at the end of the Terminator movie. So at the very last scene of the Terminator in 1984. Uh, Linda Hamilton's character was uh, Sarah Connor was driving out in the distance and you see these mountains 
they weren't real. It was a painting, and Ken Marshall painted that. And so he had that little connection with James Cameron. Uh, but when he found out that uh, James was making the movie, Ken called his office and said, hey, uh, I, I just kind of heard this. Is it true? And I was wondering if I could maybe uh, get through to James. And I just want to lend my, my experience and expertise if he needs me for the movie. And what he told me was that the secretary says, wait a minute, uh, James Cameron is looking for you. <laughs> Passed him through to James Cameron, and James Cameron says, I I want you to be involved in this because he had seen his book, Titanic and Illustrated History, and said, this is why I'm doing this movie. I want to put... <laughs> Your <laughs> paintings in the real life. <laughs> oh, wow. I love that. True story. Wow, thank you for sharing so, that. We so, love so when James Cameron said, I want to do on film what you do on campus, that's kind of how I approach this is I want to have Ken, I, basically I told him, I want you to build the real ship like you did, you know, the sets of the movie. So it's all related. It's all a timeline. It's, there's a continuous progression. And Ken has just been following the wreck and painting the, you know, the following the ship his whole life. And you remember when he talked about um, when they found the ship, he's like, it was like going to an autopsy. My beautiful ship was all over the yeah, ocean floor. Ship, I know. I felt so bad for him. I was like, it's broken. It's, it's destroyed. And there's people like, why don't they just, and that's the one thing, you know, when I was a kid, when we wanted to find Titanic, me and my, my buddy, Ron, we wanted to raise the Titanic because of what we saw in the movie, raise the Titanic. And then we saw that it was broken in two. And then, you know, we were young and probably a little naive at that point. When you really think about what happened there at that site, at that spot, and where it lies on the ocean and all the people that passed away. And it's, it really starts to hit you and you think, uh, no, nah, you can't bring that up. And so that is one of the things I love about James Cameron and his explorations is he's never retrieved anything from the wreck itself or anything like that. He just observes. That's important. Observation. Mm -hmm. Do not the, you know, destroy the wreck or, or anything like that. That's just how I feel. I know people disagree with me on that and that's fine. We all have opinions. It's just, that's my feeling on it. Um, but as far as raising the ship, there's people who want to do that. And even to this day, I disagree with that totally. And that's why I was trying to tell Ken, it's like, wouldn't it be so spectacular to build, at least in our modern age and world, something that will be alive and real, where you can smell and yeah. taste and, touch and experience and hear those engines fire up. And just look at the beauty. And, and remember yeah, that when the Cameron's movie came out, you know, like, wow. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because it That's was just, you know, he brought the, that ship to life. You know, Ken brought it in his paintings. He brought Ken's paintings to life. He did. Yeah. And, uh, we're, forever, we're forever grateful to him for doing that. Yeah. So is there any other questions uh, that oh, I answer, or are we going to wrap this up today? Yeah. I want to put Lee on the spot, but I don't know if he'll like it. But Lee is a fantastic model builder. But I thought I heard through the grapevine he doesn't um, do commission work or anything. But if you ever, he he well, could so. probably he's handle amazing. it. He's just he's just an amazing model builder. <laughs> well, my plan was to have this event on Queen Mary. It'd be a, a fundraiser uh, slash uh, media event where we'll announce to the world our, our intentions. And that um, has been pushed back because of COVID. It was supposed to be this April, uh, April of, of last year, actually. And so now it's uh, been pushed back and I keep having to push it back in six month increments. But uh, there's been a great interest on that through our website and on Facebook that there's over 500 people that want to attend. And we'll have the media there, we'll announce it just as Clive Palmer did, but you know, hopefully we'll be more accepted worldwide because of our mission and what we're trying to do. Yeah. And not only that, we want to uh, obviously raise some funds from attendees, you know, whether it's, you know, $50 or a hundred, whatever they can afford. It just helps us with our mission, which is, um, uh, you know, for a good cause. But my goal is to have those initial plans completed before and release those initial plans to the world at that time, at that event. And we'll need some type of a uh, physical structure 
uh, maybe a, a 10 foot long model based on those initial plans of what Titan will look like. And, you know, behind glass or a little plexiglass cover and people can see it, well can see it in, you know, in detail of what it will look like. That is my goal to get done within the next year or so. And that, that would be something. That would be something. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Anybody else want to say anything before we close down? Good. I'll look on Facebook really quick just to make sure I didn't miss anything. Maybe some people without a camera chime in with a text question or something. Yeah, and if um, so, if I get any questions, I can just send them your way. And again, anyone watching this, go on to our page. Um, the sstitan.org. If you do, you have your mission statement. Of, do you, I think you do your mission statement and your plans are all on your. It's very impressive. There's, a, there's an initial plan page on our website itself, and it shows if you're interested in the technical aspects of the ship, at least preliminarily. It's a preliminary specifications. They're right on there, length, width, all that kind of thing. It's, it's pretty interesting. All right. So sstitan.org. Um, thank you. I hope everyone has a great rest of the day and all stay, stay well, safe well. from everything that's going on. Uh, you said this is fun. Um, jo Judy said thank you. thank you. Thanks for coming, Judy. And um, thanks for coming, everybody. And I will we'll put this in the newsletter and um, maybe maybe we can even do a little interview with you and put that in the newsletter too. That would be nice. That would be great. Whatever questions you want to throw at me, I'll answer. I know I go into detail on these issues and I draw them out, but I just want to make sure everybody has a, a good grasp of what is going on, what my idea is and where we're heading. And, oh, sometimes yeah. you know, and then people can see you because sometimes people, you know, people need to see your face and hear your voice and, Right. Um, yes, you, you could become alive a little bit more now. Um, I hope so. <laughs> if you don't mind, we'll put this video up Very on our Facebook page. <laughs> if it's okay with you, we'll, we'd like to share this on the uh, Facebook page. And our, oh, uh, yeah. And um, Richard, will, Richard does all the recording and the YouTube. And sure. um, we could definitely for sure share that. I really appreciate the opportunity uh, to you both uh, for allowing me to come on and spend this uh, time with everybody. I know your days are busy, so... Thank you for allowing me to at least share the story. And, and the great thing is that you're recording it and we could, uh, people can always come back to it later if they miss something. Yep, I'll and have it up by the uh, end of the day, so. Excellent. And I'm always available for any questions uh, through the uh, uh, Facebook uh, Messenger um, um, app there. Uh, if you wanna send me a personal question about the ship or uh, what support, uh, you can lend if you're willing to help us out. Uh, basically, or if right you're now, out there watching and you build models, and yes. <laughs> or you feel like you have something to contribute, I'm sure there's somebody out there that you know feels that you know because I I believe in letting people find their passion. And it's like oh, I'm passionate about that. I want to get involved. So if you're one of those people, just send me a message and and we'll we'll answer it the best we can. Uh -huh. All right. Thank you. Thank but you. I'm, you. I'm sorry. I wouldn't mind a scale model of it. Did you understand that? You like you just kind of muffled on that one. Uh, say somebody that again, please. Somebody said they wouldn't mind a scale model of it. Oh, uh, yeah. Once uh, we're really going on the project, I mean, there'll be a lot of different ways we can market it, and obviously, uh, uh, models and toys and things like that. That you know, all that money's going to be going to you know support the. Uh, you know, St. Jude's or whoever we decide to work with uh, from that angle. But yeah, there'll be plenty of uh, gifts available on the website. Once we get to that point, there'll be t-shirts, uh, hats, sweaters, jackets, all sorts of that, um, coffee mugs, uh, pens, whatever we can market that'll help this cause. Yeah, that'll, that would be available probably within the next uh, year and a half, 18 months, I would say, max. Cool, we like, we like. Otherwise, I'll just have to uh, get my... I'm going to grind back into gear again and uh, build it myself. Ooh, that would be nice. Lee's the one I was talking about. He's a fantastic model builder. He's done the Titanic model. He's done the wreck model. He's really, he's up there. I'd say he's up there with uh, Roy okay. Menja, but he says, oh, Jill. He's very humble. <laughs> that's Lee Mann that's on there? Yes. Okay. 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 <laughs> Uh, well, definitely. Well, we could use you once we get the initial plans done. We're going to need somebody to help us build this this 
model that we could put on display for our events. So if that's something you're interested in, certainly, uh, you know, you can get a hold of me through uh, the SS Titan Facebook page or whatever, but uh, we can maybe talk about particulars if you uh, are interested as far as costs. Yeah, we can help get you the money for your supplies. <laughs> oh, for supplies, you know, well, I don't have you know, run a commission basis, so I, you know, personally would pay for that. Run. <laughs> we'll change your I don't do commissions policy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we need to, you know. I'm really loving this book by Matthew McConaughey. He, he's wrote this book called Green Lights, and um, it's fantastic. It's really, if you haven't read it or heard it on, I'm listening on Audible because I wanted to hear his voice because he reads it, but he talks about these green lights. Every no can be turned into a yes. Green light, you know, and he talks about all the struggles that he's been through, you know, and then he and then how they turn in his favor. Green light, he keeps popping through. He wears a hat. Green light, and it's like you know, uh, a lot of times people, you know, oh, they get disheartened. Oh, this isn't going to work out, and give up. You know, where he really, his book is very encouraging. Don't give up, you know, because you just never know when that no could turn into a yes and um it's he, he's i feel like he's very um uh, you know because you look at these people oh they're movie stars their life's been easy no it's everybody's struggling and everyone's going through something but i do have um, I, they, I did put together a uh kind of a i want to say maybe a little infomercial or some sort of a, a teaser promo type uh thing for the foundation uh, it's just pictures that I put together that, that are not my copyrights, but is that uh, on your website? Uh, no, this is something I have uh, personally in my file. Okay. Now, if somebody would like to watch that, it's 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 only for private viewing only. It's not to be distributed or anything like that. But if anybody's interested in what I put together, it's about three and a half minutes the length of the song. It really kind of shows what we're trying to do with some great musical background. And if anybody wants that, they can just email me through. Uh, either on message me through Facebook or whatever, and I'll send that to your private email as a link because it's such a long video, they have to go into uh, Google Drive, I believe, to watch it. So if that's something people are interested in seeing, uh, if I had the copyright releases, it would be on our website. And it's pretty powerful. The music and, and the, the imagery is very powerful and it's very professionally done uh, as much as I could do, you know, uh, with the Movie Maker app. And it's, it's pretty, pretty, um, Intense, I guess, put it that way. Okay, I'll sign me up. I'll send you a message. <laughs> Thank you again. Stay Thank you safe. so much, everybody. Thank you for having me on board. You're welcome. Take care. Take care. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.